You are listening to Veggie Doctor Radio, and this is episode number 89. Hey, I'm your host, Dr. Yami. I'm a board certified pediatrician, certified health and wellness coach, author, and speaker. I'm also a passionate promoter of the power of diet and lifestyle in preventing and reversing chronic disease and bringing joy and longevity into our lives. This podcast is focused on plant-based nutrition, habit formation, motivation, and mindset so that you can have the tools to live the best life possible. Are you ready to get started? Let's do this. There is no normal amount of pain. Uh, and I think that's something that all women need to understand. If it does not feel normal to you, it's not normal. It's not something that your doctor has to decide or your mom has to decide. If you feel that this is a lot of pain, then that's a lot of pain, just like heavy periods. So if it's heavy for you, it is heavy. It doesn't have to be measured out. Happy Sunday, veggie lovers. Welcome back to Veggie Doctor Radio. So excited to share today's episode with you. I know you're going to fall in love with my guest as much as I have. She is amazing. Before I tell you more about Dr. Nitu Bajakal, let me remind you of a few things. My newsletter has a fun little goodie where you learn the five pillars of healthy eating for your children, has great resources, has recipes in there, lots of great tips. If you wanna get that free download, you can go to dryami.com forward slash sign up or text the word fiber, F-I-B-E-R to 66866. In addition, if you have not already picked up a copy of my book, A Parent's Guide to Intuitive Eating, How to Raise Kids Who Love to Eat Healthy, you can find it online, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, all kinds of places. And if you're local to Yakima, you can pick it up at my office or at Inklings. So thank you very much. And for those of you who have already picked up a copy and read it, I would love and appreciate a review on Amazon. Thank you so much for that. In addition, for those of you who listen to my podcast regularly, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm so grateful for you. Thank you for tuning in every week to my episodes. If you could please subscribe, rate, and review my podcast, that would be great. I really want to get the listenership up, get this podcast out to more people, reach more people. So please also share it with your friends and family. If this episode resonates with you and you feel like it could help somebody else, please share it with them so that they can also benefit from this information. I'd like to read a review from Apple Podcast by T. DePrano title is Great Podcast. Dr. Yami's energy and enthusiasm are contagious. I love the variety of guests as well as the monologue episodes. Dr. Yami is incredibly knowledgeable and passionate about health. I have learned so much from listening. Thank you so much, T. DePrano, for that warm review. I appreciate you and I'm so glad that you're here with us. Well, my guest today is Dr. Nitu Bajikal. She is a senior consultant ob with over 35 years of clinical experience. She is a fellow of the Royal College and a recipient of the Indian President's Gold Medal. She is one of the first U.S. board-certified lifestyle medicine physicians in the U.K. She has written the Women's Health Module for the first U.K. University plant-based nutrition course. She is the founder of Women for Women's Health, a voluntary service set up to educate, energize, and empower women to make lifestyle choices to help improve their own and their family's health. Dr. Bajikal is passionate about educating women, providing reliable medical and lifestyle information for the general public, doctors, workplaces, and schools. She is a committed vegan, personally benefiting from this lifestyle as do her patients. And you're just going to love 
this amazing woman. She has a lot of great things to say. And we cover things like period pain, polycystic ovarian syndrome, but we also talk about women in healthcare and being a female in healthcare. And we talk about healthcare bias and how you can advocate for yourself when you are yourself a patient. So there's lots of wonderful things you're gonna learn from this episode. I know you're gonna love it. Thank you again for listening, subscribing, rating and reviewing my podcast. I hope you enjoy the show. Dr. Neetu, thank you so much for being on Veggie Doctor Radio today. I am so excited about our conversation. Thank you, Dr. Yami. And I have to say, I'm so honored to be invited from across the pond, all the way from London. And it's a real honor and privilege to talk to your guests and to talk to you. Yes, well, you are my very first international guest. So this is a monumental episode, you know, going oh. big time now all the way in London. And actually, I'm going to be traveling to London this summer. Forgot to Fantastic. mention that to you. So maybe, a bedroom we, can, waiting for maybe you. we can get together. We could see each other in person. That would be great. Definitely. Well, we have a lot to talk about, so I don't want to dilly-dally. Let's get started. I want to hear all about your interesting plant-based journey because you came about it in a non-traditional way than most people. So tell me about how you became vegan and how it has influenced your work. So I was actually born a vegetarian um, in Calcutta in India. Uh, my mother and father by religion would have been vegetarians, but my mother was actually an atheist. And so um, she just believed in being good. She was very spiritual. And so she was an ethical vegetarian. And um, because they were academic, my mother was a teacher. My father was an engineer. They were very interested in educating us. And so we didn't really um, have a lot of money. And so we were brought up on mainly what is known as a, nowadays a whole food plant-based diet. My mother would cook with very minimal oil. Uh, dairy was very expensive. And I used to uh, complain a lot to my mother saying, look at all my friends. They have cereal and cornflakes with milk and uh, bread and butter. And you give me all these traditional breakfasts. And she says, look who's the tallest, look who runs the fastest. I was a track athlete as well. And so she said, I don't think you have anything to complain. I think you're doing just fine. And um, occasionally I did as you rebel as a teenager. I went along and ate some goat uh, in my friend's houses. Maybe once or twice a year I did taste it. And uh, my mother said, do you not realize what you're doing? And I said, they're already dead. Um, and she said, yes, but when every time you eat something, there is um, another goat lined up to, to die. And so I still didn't think much about it because, you know, you don't really listen to what your mother says. And so I um, went to medical school, met my husband and continued to occasionally, maybe once or twice a year, eat some chicken when we got our hands on it. We were always hungry medical students. And India was predominantly vegetarian in those days. And I still didn't think too much about it um, until I reached the UK about 29 years ago. I was pregnant with my daughter and I thought I'd cook some mince for my husband. Uh, I had never cooked meat. Uh, I'd never eaten mince. He had never eaten mince. And we thought we've come to the UK. We'd gone to Scotland and I thought I'll wash um, mince because I thought you wash vegetables so you must wash meat as well so I washed it and I saw the blood running away and I got a fright of my life because I thought wow this looks exactly like the blood that I see on my patients and I became vegetarian again like completely vegetarian overnight I still hadn't made the connection with dairy at all um, so I didn't change uh, didn't really influence my daughters. I had two daughters by then and I let them have some, you know, fish fingers and sausages occasionally and never really thought too much about it um, until my daughter was about 10, my younger daughter. And she came home and she said, you're going to feed me our dog. And I said, no, I'm not. And she said, yes, mommy, you are, because I've just read uh, that pigs are as intelligent um, 
as a three or a five year old or something she told me and I said um, not really going to feed you our dogs she said yes you are uh, and so I'm not going to eat meat anymore and I said really she said yes and I think she had already decided she was going vegan and I knew you I didn't know what the word vegan meant but I knew you could be quite unhealthy uh, eating just crisps and, and drinking coca-cola and I had brought them up thinking salad was dessert so I thought okay, I've got to do this correctly. So I said, okay, if you're going to do this, I'm going to do it. So she said, you have to realize mom that, you know, dairy is the same as eating meat. And I thought, okay, there's a 10 year old trying to teach me things. And I got it straight away though. I immediately understood what she was trying to say. And around the same time I had about a year before that, I started stop, my periods had stopped. And it was quite unusual. And as a doctor, you're always in denial. So I thought, um, I've got, I'm just stressed. I was working really long hours, working all kinds of hours. And so I thought maybe I'm stressed, but actually I was going through an early menopause through mm -hmm. premature ovarian failure. I was having terrible hot flushes, really suffering. And I wasn't willing to actually diagnose myself when I knew then that actually what I was going through was premature menopause. Um, I was about to, I was toying with the idea of going on hormone replacement because that's what you should do if you ha stop your periods that early. There was no family history. Uh, my mother and sis older sister were all absolutely fine at the normal age of 51. And I, here I was about 38, 39. And so I was going to go on HRT when my daughter said, um, I'm going to become vegan. So I became vegan with her. And about three months down the line, I thought, huh, all my symptoms have gone. Um, and of course, there wasn't much choice. There was no junk foods in those days. We're talking about 18 years ago. So I was eating a plant-based, whole food plant-based diet. I was cooking at home. I was drinking soy milk. I was, my mother used to make her own soy milk, so I knew what to do. And my symptoms went away. But yummy, you know, I still didn't think it was my diet. I thought it was just that my body had got used to it. Uh, people would keep saying over the years that I look quite young and they said, oh, it must be your genes. So I said, yes, it must be my genes. Everybody said, oh, you've got so much energy. And it's true, I'm 58 and I feel about, I don't know, 25. Uh, but I still didn't put it two and two together until about 10 years ago. And I'm really quite sad uh, that I was never taught that in medical school, not a single bit of information that nutrition has so much to do with health. So I made it my mission uh, to start educating patients, to educate the public, uh, to make informed health choices. I'm not against Western medicine at all. I am a surgeon. I practice medicine. I practice gynecology, obstetrics. But I just feel there's so much we can do, which we as doctors ha don't have the tools at all to equip ourselves and our patients. So that's how my plant-based journey began. I did suffer a lot from a lot of ridicule as well as a lot of eye rolling. Um, and it was hard, not from my own, um, my own side of the family, but generally from people because they were either they didn't understand and they were curious uh, or they were felt threatened. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was really tough. Um, and I just didn't have all the answers in those days. And so I started judging myself. I started becoming quite resentful. And then I started eating a little bit of dairy when I was out. Uh, and I hated the fact that I didn't like how I felt. Um, and I started judging myself, which is why I'm in the place now. Uh, and I realized very quickly that that was not the road, road I was going to take. And I went back to my roots because I was always, I'd always, once I became vegan, I stopped wearing leather, silk and all that. So, but I used, because of the social pressures, I was eating a little bit of dairy. Um, and it just felt wrong, you know? Mm. And I now I'm in a place where I realize that everybody has their own journey and one needs to be kind um, because, you know, it can take people lots of, you know, falls and slips and then they pick themselves up and all one has to do is just be supportive. Absolutely. Oh, I love that story so much. And I love how 
there's so many different times along your path where fate or the universe was encouraging you to eat a whole food plant-based diet, right? From the beginning, from your mother. It sounds like she's a very intelligent, health-conscious person that she kind of knew in her mom brain, no, this is fine. This is a healthy way to raise my kids. Totally. You know, that's so cool that she knew that so long ago. Yeah. But and then it's called it, intuitive eating, you know? Yes. It's just explaining to people, like, you know, I used to always be rushing with work. So I would um, offer my children a choice of two dresses for example i never let them go and make a big choice and stand there for hours but i always made them feel that they were choosing mm -hmm. uh, i always discussed i would show them two or three different schools and then they could choose the school but i had actually shortlisted them down to the ones that i wanted the same way with you know i made uh, salad and uh, fruit sound really exciting so they would say please 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 can we have salad for dessert and i'd say yes if you're very very good uh, and they fell for it every time. I love that. That's great. So the reverse psychology there of <laughs> making the salad uh, very alluring. I love it. What was it that triggered your daughter? What motivated your daughter to want to go vegan? I think she started speaking at a very young age. Uh, she always spent a lot of time thinking. I think my mother and my father were big influences in their lives. They lived in India, but they would come every couple of years and spend time um, at home influencing, making them think. My mother never spent time talking about what did you eat today or what did you do today? It was more about what did you think today? What do you think about the world? Um, you know, it was a lot of abstract thinking. So both my daughters grew up thinking very abstract um, and they have continued to be in that sort of um, journey. So my brother, who was a, a doctor, my sister's also a doctor, he moved to the States and he was involved in animal research and became a vegan uh, very quickly. Mm. Uh, so, um, you know, I think he must have had an influence as well. So we had all that strong background, um, always of wanting to do good, you know, mm -hmm. to try and be, do the least harm. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so that was ingrained in us. But, you know, you don't listen until you're li willing to listen. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be in the right space. And so my husband's journey, you know, he would eat vegan at home, but outside he'd stop eating meat when I stopped eating meat. But he's an orthopedic surgeon. And so that's a very, um, you know, supposed to be this very machismo, manly speciality. So he continued to eat eggs and fish because he didn't want to draw attention to himself. And of course, he became progressively more diabetic um, mm. and put on lots of weight. And he did all kinds of diets until a few years back, he saw forks over knives. And when I came back home, he said, oh, I'm going to become plant based. And I said, really? And what did I say? He said, no, you didn't say anything. I saw a movie. And I said, what? I've been doing this for like, I don't know how many decades. Uh, <laughs> and so, so it was interesting. And now he, his only regret, now he's a board certified lifestyle medicine physician. He lost about four stone, 25 kilos, or I don't know how many pounds that is. That's a lot of, and he reversed his diabetes even before he lost his uh, weight and his skin conditions cleared up. But more than that, the energy he had, he just feels so much regret that, you know, he didn't listen to us. And he, but you know, everybody has to have their own journey and he's, yes. he's a force now and he's amazing now. And he's, you know, it has to, to be personal. It has to yeah. impact you in a way that you want to change because if other people try to change you, you might do it resentfully. You might, you're not just like you experienced in your own life. If somebody else is, you need to do this, or this is why you should do this, but you don't, you haven't internalized that. You haven't decided that on your own. You don't go in authentically, Absolutely. you know? Absolutely. And, but, but I love that because I'll just take it wife to wife, you know, are, I mean, I feel like my husband's like that all the time. I'll be, I'll be telling him stuff like, Hey, why don't you think about this? Why don't you think about this? And like all this time will pass. And then one friend will tell him and he's like, Oh, I think I should do that. I'm like, I've been telling you forever, <laughs> but you know, it's fine. It's fine. I know. We, we know that we were there first. So absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. He, he agrees. He, he agrees. And you know, well, he better agree. <laughs> 
<laughs> so. But I, I love how you brought up his story too, because I think a lot of people don't realize that eggs and fish too, because I think fish yeah. is in a weird place right now, you know, yeah. with the pescatarian studies and things like that, that, that can also increase your risk for diabetes as well, especially You're for right. people that are insulin resistant. So thank you so much for telling his story. Well, when it comes to gynecology, that's very important to women because through, during the childbearing years, we have periods and periods yes. can bring with them lots of issues, including pain. So I want to talk to you about pain in periods. What would be considered a normal amount of pain and what is pain during a normal period actually caused by? Okay. So first of all, there is no normal amount of pain. Uh, and I think that's something that all women need to understand. If it does not feel normal to you, it's not normal. It's not something that your doctor has to decide or your mom has to decide. If you feel that this is a lot of pain, then that's a lot of pain, just like heavy periods. So if it's heavy for you, it is heavy. It doesn't have to be measured out. So we know that pain is caused by prostaglandins, which is a chemical substance released from the lining of your womb that makes your womb uh, have cramps. And as a result, that can give you enough pain to make you want to lie down, to even throw up. So prostaglandins have multiple uh, actions. In some women, they'll make them feel nauseous. They may uh, vomit. Uh, they may have loose motions. They may feel uh, um, that their uh, stomach is really cramping up. They may also have heavy periods. So it's got lots of different symptoms. Some women may have all of them. Some women may have just one or two of them. Now, if it's making you miss school or uh, stop going to work, then that's certainly something that has to be seriously considered. If your usual painkillers are not working and you need to be taking, if you're going to take painkillers, then it needs to be of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug group because they are anti-prostaglandins, which means that paracetamol and aspirin don't really work for period pain. It's got to be something that fights those prostaglandins. But there are lots of other ways of also actually fighting those prostaglandins. It's not just drugs. So if, and uh, you know, nine days of every year of working days are missed by women because of period problems, painful periods and heavy periods. And it's not just absenteeism. It's also something called presenteeism. You know, when you're there, but you're actually unwell and you're having a cramp and you can't really focus on the meeting, that's really important. And the things that one can do for themselves, um, which we often don't talk about as medics, you know, but we know that if, if a um, woman exercises leading up to her period, then her, uh, the period pains are much less. If she exercises during her periods, and the only exercise um, that you may be advised not to do are handstands. We're not entirely sure whether that's a good idea or not. There's not enough research about it. But really exercising at all points helps to wash away the prostaglandins and normalize um, the hormones as well. The same thing with heat. Um, so if you use a hot water bottle on your stomach, you will find that the pains um, disappear or they certainly ease. And the other thing is ensuring that you have lots of sleep. And if you're having exams, it's really important that you actually work out for yourself that, you know, you don't stay up too late. You're not going to change the results of your um, um, board exams. What you want to do is you want to get a good night's sleep because that allows your body to heal all the cells to repair. So you want to look at stress, you want to look at sleep, you want to look at exercise, you want to make sure that they're not drinking too much of coffee or drinking alcohol. All these things will actually increase your, um, initially it'll feel like it's helping your pain, but actually it doesn't, it actually can make it worse. But diet, I have to say, is really undersold. Mm -hmm. When you eat foods that are rich in fiber, uh, which is, you know, which are fruits and vegetables and beans and intact whole grains and nuts and seeds. All these things can really help in, we know that it helps periods. So why not try all these aspects as well? And certainly take tablets if you need to, you know, take the N NSAID group of drugs, but you have to start them eat as soon as you see the period or even the day before, because for 
for them to have the maximum action, they need to reach a drug level before the prostaglandins reach so much. So if you take it once the pain has started, you're going to have to wait a lot longer for the drug to work. But if you can actually build in exercise and yoga and, uh, you know, reduce your coffee and alcohol and get good sleep and eat a green leafy, lots of vegetables, you know, fiber rich beans and intact whole grains, brown rice, mushrooms and things like that, you'll actually find that your pain will be much better because it helps things like we have, sh there are studies to show that conditions like endometriosis where the lining, uh, which is very similar to the lining of the womb grows outside, does very well when you get animal products out of your diet and does well when you actually introduce green leafy vegetables and fruits, especially citrus fruits. There have been studies to show that. Interesting. Well, I love how all of the factors that you're talking about basically is just lifestyle medicine, right? So it's it like a whole food, plant-based diet, emphasize the whole plant foods, exercise, yeah. sleep, decrease your stress, and then avoid substances. But yes. can you talk a little bit more about why diet, why fiber in particular is so important when it comes to period pain and decreasing the risk of endometriosis and these kinds of things? So when you eat foods that are devoid of fiber, um, so for example, if your diet is often like a standard Western diet that contains no fiber, what happens is they often contain something called advanced glycation end products. These are very um, highly um, toxic and reactive molecules. You do produce these AGEs or advanced glycation end products in your own body as a waste product, but a lot of it comes from your diet. So if your diet is consisting of foods that are fried um, or they are, um, you know, junk and ultra processed foods like cereals and, you know, uh, animal based foods, then what happens is these will basically cause tissue damage. They increase insulin resistance and insulin, you know, will trigger the ovaries to produce estrogen. And then that estrogen has to get excreted out into your um, through your bowel and and basically there's something called the enterohepatic circulation. I don't want to go into too much of medical stuff, but what I want to say is the fiber then traps the estrogen, which then allows your body hormones to get normalized. But when that those bacteria that digest the uh, fiber and that fiber is not available, then you have havoc being created in your system. And when you then start putting on weight, then the body fat gets converted uh, preferentially into male hormones and then into estrogen. So that then increases conditions like polycystic ovarian syndrome, endometriosis, which causes painful periods, painful sex, difficulty with fertility. Also, of course, you know, other painful and heavy periods just on their own, even if you don't have conditions like adenomyosis, but also increase your longer term risk of heart disease and diabetes. And, you know, Yami, more women die of heart disease than men, but because it's not something that's spoken about, because women often will have symptoms that are not typical of the typical crushing chest pain and things, nobody really realizes it. They're not taken very seriously when they present to the ER. So, you know, heart disease, diabetes, breast cancer, ovarian, endometrial cancer, these are all estrogen fueled cancers. So I think it's really important to understand estrogen is really important for our body, but too much of too many hormones and imbalance of hormones is basically what's going to start. You know, you end up paying a price with symptoms, which your doctor might just give you, you know, medications or surgery, but you're not really tackled with the, the main issue. Exactly. So, yeah, I mean, I love that. The, that key word is balance. And I had Dr. Barnard on a few episodes back where we talked about the same thing. You do need estrogen. It's very important yes. for the way that our body functions. Oh. But whenever you have too much, then it can cause a cascade of other symptoms. And some of these too, like you say, they're so interrelated that having one of these things might indicate that you're at higher risk of something else, such as yes. heart disease or yes. cancers, things like that. So it's really important. And and I just want to reemphasize what you were saying about the the way that fiber helps is it's the way I explain it is that fiber 
acts like a binder. When yes. it's in your digestive system, it helps to bind and absorb that excess hormones. And then you poop it out with your waste. So that way it doesn't right. keep recirculating and recirculating and recirculating in your bloodstream, causing effects. Because what, that's what hormones do. They cause effects. They're signaling molecules that make things happen. So whenever you have too much, then you may have too many bad things that are happening that you don't want yes. to be happening. So fiber is very, very, very important. So definitely listen to Dr. Nitu about that. Can I well, just also yeah. mention that people often get confused as to where you can find fiber. Mm. You don't find it in a capsule. You, mm -hmm. I mean, you can, but it's, that's not the way to take fiber. Fiber is present in plant foods. So it's present in fruit. Raspberries have lots of fiber, for example, which we don't look at it you know, innocent looking fi uh, fruit, um, you know, vegetables have it, beans have it, and potatoes have it, you know, intact whole grains have it. But what doesn't have it is all the junk foods, the ultra processed foods, oils, fruit juices that are shop bought, and, you know, eggs, fish, meat, chicken, dairy, none of them have fiber. So every time you make a choice, no food is bad. You know, people often say, Dr. Bajikal, are you telling me that eggs are bad for me? No, eggs are not bad for you. Compared to what? They're, they're better for you than sausages, but they cannot stand a chance in front of a bowl of um, oatmeal. You know, mm -hmm. that no, the fish is not bad for you compared to probably, I don't know, again, sausages, but it, can it stand, you know, in, uh, head to head with uh, baked potatoes and baked beans and a salad? No, you know? So it's just understanding that, that no food is bad. You just have to find the right foods because you only eat a certain amount of food. So you've got to make good choices because, you know, you're going to get full and then you made the wrong choices and your body doesn't feel, doesn't thank you for it. Exactly. No, that's a great point. And I know that the UK is becoming very similar to the United States in the amount of animal and processed foods that are consumed. Here in the United States, 94% of our calories come from either animal or processed foods. Only 6% that we're eating in actually whole plant foods. And then we have over 60% of our calories, ultra processed foods. That means that there are foods that can only be made in a factory devoid of fiber, but also devoid of antioxidants. But that's a really important point because me in pediatrics, what I see often is parents that want to replace their child's fiber with fiber gummies. Gummies are very popular now, so you can have anything in gummy form, but fiber gummies are becoming very popular. Not a good it's idea. So much cheaper, easier, and feels so much better in the body to just get it from food. So thank Absolutely. you so much for bringing that up. And it's so simple. You know, you, people often think that eating a plant based diet is expensive. I have lots of little tricks because I spend time in schools and things and in, in young students, university students. And I say, you know, shop at the end of the day when you will find that the prices have been taken down. Shop, you know, in open markets, on, in the weekend markets, uh, shop in uh, ethnic um, uh, uh, markets and shops because you will get, you know, in uh, bulk, you can buy beans and, and rice and quinoa and all the things that you want to buy, which can be expensive in a standard supermarket. So, you know, you've got to be shopping intelligently. And what really upsets me is people often say, oh, for a pregnancy, for to be vegan or to be on a plant-based diet, you've got to really plan. And I say, to be healthy, whatever diet you have to be, you have to plan. So it's not specially only to do with you know, a vegan pregnancy or a vegetarian pregnancy, you need to be planning these things. You can't just eat anything because then you're going to end up eating junk and ultra processed foods. So planning is key. But once you've learned how to plan for the first week or two, then it becomes second nature. Exactly. I think when people hear that, and I think physicians also, and maybe some of the policy making, at least here in this country, we make people think that it's going to be really complicated and really and difficult. Not. And it yeah. really isn't. It's pretty simple for a lot of people. Like you said, the first couple of weeks, you're learning something new because that's not what they're used to doing. But once you get it down, I feel like it's even simpler than before. There's so many convenience foods now too, that are actually whole plant foods Correct. that are very acceptable. And there's lots of ways to save money. And I, I enjoy saving money because I want to put money to other things that I value as well. Absolutely. And it doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be complicated. So I do want people to kind of start thinking about that 
how they can make this a little bit more simpler for their lives. Well, you kind of and there's a lot of help available now. There are so Mm -hmm. many um, uh, options where you can actually look at wonderful social media sites, which will help you with making good choices, simple choices. You know, it's not going to be that difficult. Yeah, it really isn't. It reminds me actually of some funny memes that have been going around with, it'll be a picture and it'll say, um, this is a new vegan recipe and it'll be like a cutie orange or like a banana that's peeled. So it goes from being unpeeled to peeled and it's, it's hilarious, but at the same time, it's also truth, right? Like fruits and vegetables It doesn't have to be hard, people. It doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be hard. It can be really simple. It doesn't have to be hard at all. (laughs) You know, it's not that hard to boil a bunch of new potatoes and then, you know, put a a tablespoon of mustard on it or some, you know, uh, tomato ketchup that you really like and then just chop down on it. It's not Mm -hmm. that hard. And that's going to give you all your fiber. You know, nobody's asking you to eat potatoes for every meal, but you know, you must base every single meal on a complex starchy carbohydrate, whatever your age, whether you are a child or an adult, a man or a woman, complex starchy carbohydrates is what keeps us slim, gives us the fiber, keeps us out of hospitals and sorts out our pregnancy related problems and our gynecological issues as well. Starchy complex carbohydrates is what all long living societies that live to a ripe old age eat. And we know that. Yeah. And it's what gives us energy because our body runs on glucose. Our brain runs on glucose. And that's what our body wants to use. Of course, when it's in the complex form, it's good because we don't absorb it super quickly. Our body can break it down, put it into the components it needs to, to use them. And it works much better with the fiber. So that's why it's important to eat in the complex form, but we need those carbohydrates. And there's so much carb phobia right now. Everybody wants to avoid carbs and carbs are the devil and carbs are evil, but they're not. They're what runs our body. So very so beans, smart words. <laughs> yeah, beans and peas and, you know, pulses and rice, you know, quinoa, millet, barley, potatoes. I'm glad you said rice. I, I didn't want you to leave out rice as my favorite. So <laughs> yes. And I also I want to just explain when people talk about portions, they don't understand what a portion means. And if you want to mm-hmm. weigh it out, it's 80 grams, but you don't want to weigh out your food. This is the beauty about eating a plant based diet is you don't have to chase calories. Mm-hmm. So what you have to just remember is you're trying to eat about 10 to 12 portions of f- uh, fruit and vegetables every day. And, and that is basically a handful. So if you're a child, it's a tiny handful. A couple of little slices of apple is a, is a portion. While if you are an adult, it would be an apple, a banana, a, a big salad, a soup will give you all your 10 and 12 portions. It's not very difficult at all. It's no need to complicate things. It's just remembering that a portion is a handful rather than, oh, I have to weigh my food out. I have to check the calories. You don't need to do any of that. You just need to eat real food. Yes. And paying attention to your hunger and your fullness. I think we've gotten so stuck on dieting and calorie counting and macro counting. A lot of people are afraid to eat until they feel satisfied. But the beauty about eating whole plant foods is you can get comfortably satisfied eating that food. You don't have to be walking around hungry. You can eat till you're satisfied. That's really, really important. Well, let's talk a little bit more about polycystic ovarian syndrome and what that is, how that's related to what we were talking about before. What are the the symptoms of it and how do you diagnose this in a woman? So this is a condition that is very complex. Um, It's got um, a genetic background to it so that it can run in families as well. Um, but it has a huge impact, the environment and um, the metabolic factors at all play, just like diabetes and heart disease. So just because somebody in the family has polycystic ovarian syndrome, it doesn't mean that you're going to develop it. It's essentially a condition where your ovaries will develop these small little cysts, which are empty egg follicles. They don't go anywhere. They don't grow to any size. But they basically, there is a hormone imbalance. And so what happens, there are 
you need two out of three features to diagnose polycystic ovaries, which means that either you have to have some features that are uh, suggestive of uh, an ovulation. That means you're not releasing eggs regularly. So you may have missed periods or you may have no periods at all. So that could be a sign. Uh, the other one, the second is that you also have to have one of the other two, which means that you would have increased levels of male hormones, which means that if you have, uh, you know, changes with um, the loss of hair or frontal balding, these are things that can also be responsible. And then the third factor is an ultrasound diagnosis. So you need to have two out of three so features of anovulation, features of increased male hormones, and an ultrasound diagnosis of polycystic ovaries. You can diagnose it as in teenagers. You have to be a bit careful, but there is a condition of adolescent um, PCOS. It is actually about three quarters of women who suffer from this condition actually don't get diagnosed. Uh, mm -hmm. So it is quite common, uh, but it often gets underdiagnosed. And we know that two out of 10 women are not overweight. So the vast majority are overweight or obese, but women who are not overweight um, will also, when they have a scan of the intra-abdominal fat, they're actually carrying more fat inside. So mm -hmm. we know that this can result in symptoms like missing your periods, not having periods at all, increased facial hair, you may have uh, anxiety, depression, and difficulty in sleeping. You may have breathing trouble, you may have acne, you can have uh, loss of hair, you can have um, darkening of your skin. So you can also have features suggestive of insulin resistance, so diabetes type of features. So it can have a range of symptoms that can be very distressing if you're a young woman, uh, you know. But we know that the first way of managing polycystic ovarian syndrome is to try, if you're overweight, to try and lose weight. We know losing even as little as 5 to 10% of your body weight can result in uh, improvement of symptoms. But if you want to maintain, so you can lose weight in many ways. You can do all these fad diets and lose weight. But if you actually follow a whole food plant-based way of eating, you reduce, remember those advanced glycation end products that we were talking about, they're particularly toxic to the ovaries. And so when you reduce your insulin resistance, when you eat the right foods and which are fiber rich, what happens is you can maintain the weight loss long term, which means that pregnancy then doesn't become such an issue. Also, you don't have so much of yo-yo dieting as well. So, you know, yes, losing weight is important, but how you lose it, in my opinion, and studies are showing more and more of that, including soy, including fiber-rich foods, really make a difference uh, for this condition that can be really not very pleasant at all. Mm -hmm. And because it is a hormone, hormonal imbalance that is causing yeah. this, I imagine that when somebody is going from a typical Western diet into a more high fiber diet, a whole food plant-based diet, that they can have changes pretty rapidly. Have you had any cases where people were able to reverse their, their polycystic ovarian syndrome? I have virtually on a weekly basis, I will have patients who will write into me saying, you know, once they've come to see me, they've come to me sometimes not having had periods for two years. They're not having an eating disorder. They don't have uh, other issues. Yesterday, I saw a girl who had lost over 70 pounds and you know, she had not had periods from the time. She'd, she'd hardly had a couple of periods after starting. She was young and since losing her weight and being on a plant-based diet, her periods have been coming regularly for the last three years. I had another young girl who for two years hadn't uh, had a period at all. And then she went on a whole food plant-based way of eating. Wh within a month, she started her periods and she has been having regular cycles. I've had women who've not got pregnant and then they, they change the way they eat and I get fantastic news. You know, recently I operated on a lady, a young woman who had quite severe endometriosis. I had to operate on her. She had these big cysts on her ovaries and now she's due for her baby anytime soon. So, Aww. you know, it is fantastic when you see, it's like a, you know, it's quite magical and it's quite a miracle cure, but the thing is it's cheap, it's free, it's safe. And so nobody talks about it because it's not some fancy, you know, 
robotic surgery that I'm doing or mm -hmm. something so, you know, people want to talk about this new drug and this new way when actually we've got the answer already. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just to remind the listeners that many interventions are not treating the root cause. Correct. So whenever you change your diet and your lifestyle habits, you can actually treat the root cause and it can solve your problem and give you so many other benefits. It's like the opposite of medications, right? Which most medications have side effects. So you're like, okay, what are the risks and benefits of this medication? It might help this, but it's going to give me this. Whenever you change your diet and your lifestyle, the side effects are actually beneficial side effects that They're make good, you feel right? great and help in so many other things. So Absolutely. definitely something to it's consider. It's the same diet. It's the same diet that stops you from having polycystic ovarian syndrome or heals you with regards to endometriosis. It's the same diet that keeps you out of hospital from heart disease and diabetes and arthritis and becoming overweight or obese. It's the same diet that stops us from having cognitive uh, def defects, you see, and, and memory loss and, um, you know, healthy pregnancies. We know that a study many years ago showed that, uh, you know, being vegan and pregnant is absolutely fine. Um, you know, all you need to do, like all pregnant women, is to make sure that you eat healthily. Um, mm -hmm. And so, Really, there is no stage of life, I think, that does not benefit from, there's no different diet, you know, there's no PCOS diet or no dementia diet uh, or <laughs> diabetes diet. It's all the same. It's mm -hmm. eating whole plant foods. Absolutely. I love it. Well, let me ask you something that like nobody ever talks about, but I'm curious about this for personal reasons. And I've been yeah. talking to a lot of my girlfriends and my mom even, and that is middle schmerz. So middle schmerz is ovulatory pain. You get it in the middle of your cycle when your ovary is about to release an egg. Some women feel this. I'm one of those people that I feel everything. It's very strong for me. Sometimes very, very painful is middle schmerz a normal thing and or could that be a sign of a hormonal imbalance and i know that some women don't feel it at all but what can you tell me about it so middle smurz is exactly like what you said it is mid ovulatory pain uh, it suggests that everything is working in good order rather than anything more serious at all so there's nothing to be concerned i think part of um so some cycles are not ovulatory. So any normal, um, preg um, normal woman may have out of every 12 months, she may not necessarily release an egg for two or three of the cycles. So some months you may not feel it, um, others you might. And the reason I think some women are much more aware like you are, is some women are a bit more in tune with their bodies. They're actually listening to the signs. And so they see the change in the vaginal mucus. They see the change in the, uh, in the pain that they have. They're much more aware. And I think, that may be one of the reasons. And of course, sometimes, you know, women may be ovulating and they never have any pain at all. And, you know, they don't have painful periods. Maybe they're doing everything right already with regards to their periods. But mid-ovulatory pain, nothing to worry about. Okay, great. I feel better now. <laughs> <laughs> I just know exactly when that yes. egg's popping off. That I'm just means you're you, in can, tune with, your, with your body. <laughs> you're in tune with your body. Great. Okay, well, I want to change gears a little bit and talk about something else that you're passionate about, which is bias in healthcare, especially yeah. for women of color. Can you tell me a little bit more about this and what kind of experiences you've had? Okay. I think there are two aspects to this, um, which I have observed. Uh, one of them is from being a woman of color in my profession. Uh, and then for patients on the receiving end who are people of color. I think there's two different types of experiences. Um, I think people, women of color, we know that there are studies, a recent study showed from Oxford that um, black women are five times more likely to die, uh, you know, um, have, um, well, die in childbirth really, uh, which is quite horrific if you think about it. Now, you can sort of explain it away by saying that, uh, you know, maybe they're more high risk, but 
I don't think it really addresses the issue. And we do think that there is a problem because we may not take women seriously. I certainly remember reading Serena Williams had a pulmonary embolism mm. and it took her quite some time to get recognized that she was actually being serious when she said she couldn't breathe. Um, I don't know the in details of that situation, but I do know that you know, it's not just a question of women being more stoic uh, just because you are a woman of color. I just think you may not be, you may be more invisible. You may not be heard so much by the medical profession. And the medical profession doesn't necessarily have to be, uh, they also may be people of color. It's just that we've been conditioned to think that, you know, somehow, um, people of color may have to be treated slightly differently, even though it's, these are all unconscious bias, I think. I don't think anybody deliberately wants to do this. Uh, that is my take on it. Um, I personally haven't uh, done any research in it, but this is what I've observed of, you know, having been a, in a, a doctor in India as well. I did see that if the woman didn't speak the language, if she came from a lower caste, if she was, um, not well off she didn't get somehow she was just not important enough mm -hmm. you know and that has always stuck with me that really you want to treat everybody um as if it was you or your daughter or your mother in that place and i think if you do that you tend not to go wrong because you do want the best for your family as a doctor i have been fortunate uh, that i have not really I'm quite a confident person myself, and but um, speaking to my daughters, they think that I just have got a very thick skin and have uh, ignored when there were some very obvious situations where I might have um, been um, discriminated against. But the truth is that I do believe that if you're a woman of color, you do have to be, I know it's very contrived, but I do think you have to be twice as good. Uh, you have to work twice as hard to be half as good um, mm. because the expectations as an immigrant coming into England, I did get very good treatment, but I did have to work really hard. Uh, and I was never scared of hard work, but I did find that I was working way harder than a lot of people. I was very ambitious. I wouldn't say that. Uh, and I had a very supportive husband. Uh, but I think there is definitely an um, element of truth in it. And I think if you are especially not privileged, like I am very privileged, I think the differences can be very enhanced. Yeah. Well, and you've been in the profession for 35 years. So you came at it at a time, especially being in a surgical specialty. Yes. I mean, such courage to do that. I feel yes. like me in primary care and the time that I've become a physician, it's a little bit easier for women. We still see some disparity there for women in, yeah. in medicine as far as pay and things like that. But I feel like for me, it's a little bit easier. And I can, I know that you've probably went through a lot of a lot of things in your career that you I had to stand and I still up and get fight it, Yami. for. I still get it. My colleagues and I, we were talking about it just yesterday. Um, I was doing a really complicated operation yesterday. I finished quite late. Um, but regularly, I'll get asked by patients, oh, um, are you going to be doing the surgery? And I feel like saying, who else is going to be doing your surgery? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and my friend was saying, okay, maybe I should say my husband will come and do it. But he's a dentist. But that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. You know, but we do get this all the time. And so, you know, one has to smile it away, but one has to put it very quickly out. And so I am quite firm with situations like that. I encourage my trainees to actually, you know, not be shy of the fact that they are women and that they should be bold enough to talk about it, but also to not put themselves down we're forever apologizing as women you know mm -hmm. i'm so sorry i did this i'm so sorry i'm such a bad person for eating a piece of chocolate cake no you're nothing there's no judgment there just do what you need to and don't apologize because men don't and so you know i just think we need to be bolder and prouder and more confident and i do think women shouldn't spend a lot of time running other women down mm. i think we need to be supporting each other you know, because we've gone through centuries of uh, discrimination. And so, you know, we need to be 
talking about justice, justice for all. And, and if we don't support each other, there's always going to be somebody else coming in to break it all up. Oh, thank you so much. That is such an important message, especially this day and age. It's not a competition. It's There's enough for everybody. And we're going to do better if we lift each other up and support one another. That's, oh, I love it. Thank you so much for bringing that up. What advice do you have for women of color or people of color or just patients in general how can they advocate for themselves when they are in a space as a patient? That's a very good question for me because, you know, about 10 years ago, I decided to go part-time and my daughter said, but you've, you know, we've already left home and we are working and in university. Why are you doing this? I said, this is my time. So I tell women, first of all, take time out for yourselves. I think that's really important. The other thing is to inform yourself. Don't just assume that your doctor knows best. Nobody, it's one of my taglines is nobody knows your body better than you, okay? And so listen to your body. Self-care is important, but don't just assume that whoever's advising you something it is doing it knowing everything about you. So I actually set up a voluntary project and I run something called Women for Women's Health, where my mission is to empower women, to educate women so that they can make informed health choices, not just for themselves, but for their friends, for their community, for their children, for their partners, because women tend to talk. And so I think if you don't ask the questions, you will not get the answers. Don't be shy. Don't just say, oh, I wish, I'm sure my doctor wishes the best for me. I'm sure they do. But, you know, doctors are humans as well. They have other pressures. So if you don't look out for yourself, who is going to come and look out for you? You know, you've got to ask the questions. You've got to know the resources. You've got to make that. And if you see somebody in a position where they are not having that opportunity and you can help them, then go out of your way to help them. Because, you know, there's nothing better than actually being of use to somebody else. That's why we are here on this world. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you for that. And thank you for setting up that resource for people. I think that it can be very difficult for some people, it especially is. if they're more introverted or timid. Whenever you come with a person that seems to have a lot of authority, it, it might be really difficult for some people to kind of step up and say, this is my question or this is my concern. But I think that it's important for people like that to practice beforehand. Yes. Especially if you know that you're going to go talk to your doctor and you know that there's something that you want to have addressed that you're afraid might not get addressed. Practice in front of a mirror, write it out the way you want to say it. So it, you know, doesn't come off too harsh or too sudden or whatever, but practice it because the only way you're going to get better at advocating for yourself is to do it over and over again. And then it yeah. gets easier over time. That first time Absolutely. might be really hard. Be that annoying patient if it means, because you know, at the end of the day, you need to do your research. You need to let your doctor know that you're done your research and that you want to have all the information. I always say informed consent means nothing. Informed consent is what your uh, health professional decides to inform you about. Instead, you should make sure that you have all the options whatever they may be. And it's for you to decide that, oh, I can't do a plant-based diet. It's too hard. The doctor's not the person to decide for you. Oh, if I'm going to recommend a diet for them, they're going to find it really tough. So we won't mention, we'll tell them to do moderation. No, you will need to know the truth about all the options, all the medications, all the surgical options, all the lifestyle options. And if you don't find it, go look for it. Because, you know, in most situations you have the time, unless you have a broken leg or, you know, it's really urgent. In almost every situation, you have time to go away and the internet is fantastic. It can misguide you, but stick with good sites. You know, go to the NHS Choices, go to Mayo Clinic, the Harvard School of Health, you know, go to uh, Dr. Neil Barnard's site, go to nutritionfacts.org and Dr. Greger. There's plenty of information. So I don't want anybody to ever feel that they haven't had enough information and they've had to make a choice in, in haste. Mm -hmm. It's not good. Mm, I love it. What do you wish more women knew? Okay. I think... I wish more women knew what I wish I had known many years ago, that the way I was leading my life 
um, with kindness was actually not just the kindest for my body and for my health, but also is the kindest way of eating and living your life for the planetary health and also the kindest for the animals that we share uh, this planet with. This is something I just wish as a doctor I had known um, that there was, you know, there's no different way of living. This is the best way. This is a joyful way of living. I just wish that I knew that all those years ago. And I just wish that everybody knows, which is why I want to talk to as many medical students, as many doctors, because we have a terrific influence on people. I want people like you to keep spreading the message because it's really, really important that, you know, when you lead a life where you don't have to calorie count, you don't have to diet, you have better sleep, better mood, better health, you're also helping the world where your children and grandchildren are hoping to have some sort of life and not have food wars and water wars. And that the billions of animals that are getting killed every single day, when there's no need to, then mm -hmm. I think I just want people to know that. Oh, such a beautiful message. Thank you so much. And, and you are, you're doing the work. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. Well, what personal habit are you most proud of? How did you develop it and how do you maintain it? Well, I think I don't really, I'm, you know, because being a doctor and being a, an OBGYN, I've never really been able to have any regular habits. I've got one silly little habit in the sense, it's not silly, but I, I, you know, I, sw I have two rescue dogs. And before that I had a dog, um, he lived till he was nearly 16, 17. So, and I'm quite house proud. And although I've, I'm very lucky, I have help uh, with cleaning. I like to um, use an Indian broom called a jhadu. And I actually sweep the uh, the floor every single day. It takes about 15 minutes. Uh, and I find it's like a relaxation as well as an exercise. And I do it even if my cleaner's been and gone, I still will do it. Uh, and I feel really satisfied. I don't know. It's a very good feeling. The house looks neat. And I have moved all the muscles that I know normally use. And it's like a meditation. The other thing that I think I've developed over the years, and again, sounds a little bit, I don't know, like my daughters might say fake, <laughs> but I have realized how privileged I am over the last 15, 20 years. And so I do like to just reflect um, on how I practice some gratitude practices, you know, just to say that I'm so fortunate. How can I help those um, humans and children and animals that are less fortunate? And I can get quite into a low mood and feel quite despondent. Uh, sometimes I can be depressed and I feel what, unless I think about these things, then I find it hard. You know, sometimes I might find it difficult to get out of bed or something. So I just reflect on my, the love of my family, the fact that I do a job that doesn't feel like a job. I get paid for it and I love it so much. I'll never retire. Uh, so, <laughs> You know, and discovering lifestyle medicine as well, being vegan, you know, I'm just so grateful that I've, you know, that I've been able to be awake um, most of my life being aware of these things. I just feel that being grateful is something that is so undersold again. It's really important for me. Oh, that's so beautiful. Definitely. And you're not the only guest that has said that they practice gratitude as one of their oh. habits and how much it changes um, your life. And it really it does. does. It can totally change your mood just very quickly whenever you actually start reflecting on those things that you're grateful for. And I, I want to com commend you on your sweeping habit. <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm not going to be. I'm not going to be joining you on that sweeping <laughs> habit because I'm not a sweeper. <laughs> but it takes me back to my Indian roots, Yami. You know, because every time I take the jhadu, uh, which is the Indian broom, I don't know. It takes me back to my. You know, I was 30 when I left India, so I did spend quite a lot of time in India, and I don't know something about 
everything I do with that action just sort of makes me feel happy. It's so crazy. Yeah. But no, I mean, it does sound like it could be meditative, especially if you look at it from that different perspective. Yeah. But I was going to say that my grandmother, she still wants to sweep and mop her floors twice a day like no matter what, like nobody can yeah. stop that woman. And I think it is one of the, it's very traditional. Like you take yeah. care of your house, you have pride in your house, make sure yeah. that it's clean, especially because in Panama, it's all hard, you know, tile yeah. floors. So yeah. if you have dirt there, it's very obvious. Absolutely. That's so cool. <laughs> sorry. It was a funny one. No, you <laughs> but... shouldn't be sorry. I love it. It's, it's unique. And it makes yeah, yeah, I'm not going to do like the typical maybe. woman thing of being sorry. Actually, I'm very proud of it. <laughs> Good. You know, and, and you never know a, a few months down the road, maybe I'm going to pick up, pick up the sweeping habit and my husband will be very grateful for that. So, <laughs> well, actually, you know what? I think we underestimate the power of natural movement mm -hmm. and, and housework. I know that we, I remember I was moaning once many years ago, about 25 years ago, about hoovering the house, vacuuming the house. And my, uh, because I love the house to look nice. And my sister-in-law said, why do you moan? If you don't want to do it, don't do it. Nobody cares. And actually I realized, you know what? I'm moving all my muscles. I'm lifting stuff. And actually it has paid off. You know, I'm mm -hmm. 58 and I, I am very active. So I think that's, it's, it's a good thing. So it reminds me of that study that they did with the housekeepers where they split them into groups and they told half of the housekeepers that, hey, whenever you go around and you're cleaning all these, I think they were in, in hotel, like hotel housekeepers, yeah. when you're going around these rooms and you're cleaning, that's actually exercise. Yeah. And then they just told the other group about exercise, but they didn't tell them that what they were doing was exercise. Wow. I think it was like a 12 week study. By the end of the study, the group that they had told what you're doing is actually exercise actually lost weight. I Which is, they that. didn't change anything else. It's just totally your mindset. Mind. Isn't that amazing? All of a sudden you're like, hey. Anything. <laughs> you can complain about chores, but we all have to do chores, you know? Mm -hmm. it, and you can see the effects in India where a lot of people now don't do chores. You know, they go from cars from one place to another and they have, you know, help all the time at home. Plus they have all the Western appliances. So you can see that becomes a very sedentary society. Even us in the Western world, it is a real issue now. You know, you go mm -hmm. to work in a car, you don't walk anywhere, you go and sit at a desk, then you come home because you're so tired and you sit again in front of the television. It's something that, you know, now we don't even have to have advertisements anymore. So you can fast forward to the program yep. that you're watching. So, you know, it's yes. just snack time and no moving time. They say sitting is the new smoking, don't they? It is. Yes, it is. And it feels so good to move your body. So now think of different perspective for chores. I'm yeah. going to start, I'm going to start meditating on that and you'll see, <laughs> I'm going to become a sweeper too. So, <laughs> so Dr. Nitu Bajakal, how can listeners connect with you and what services do you provide? So I work on the NHS as well. Uh, I uh, see patients as part of the NHS uh, National Health Service, which I love, which is one of the main reasons I stayed back in England. I also do private practice um, in, in gynecology. I don't do obstetrics anymore because I have reached a certain age where they would prefer me to give more uh, opinions. Uh, to reach me, the best way would be to log on to my website, which is www.nitubagical.com. So it's N-I-T-U-B-A-J-E-K-A-L.com. I have about 40 leaflets, I think, on that, on different uh, gynecological and lifestyle conditions, which I think is quite helpful for women. I'm also, uh, I can be found quite easily on Instagram as at Dr. Neetu Bajikal. So I'm very happy to engage with people. I don't give medical advice, but I talk about a range of conditions, range of interesting things, which I think people will find uh, quite helpful. Awesome. And you were talking about the group that you lead. Would people be able to find that on your website as well? So the Women for Women's Health? Yes. Mm -hmm. So if you go on my website, there's a link that takes you in. I go to schools. I talk to the public. It's completely voluntary because, you know, doing private practice in England, I have... Um, I don't really get to spend my money that much. I don't buy designer clothes and things. So I use my money for women, for women's health. And so it's completely voluntary. It's completely, um, 
I just like doing it. I love doing what I do. Awesome. I can see your face light up. So I can tell <laughs> that you're telling the truth. Can you please leave us with a call to action for the week? What is one thing that my listeners can do this week to improve their lives? Uh, it would have to be what I tell all my patients. Be kind to yourself. Do something for yourself every single day that is special for you. Doesn't matter if you are a grandmother, whether you are a mother with small children. It might be two minutes. It might be five minutes. It might be a whole day in the spa. It doesn't matter. But do something every single day this week uh, just for yourself. Because when you're kind to yourself, you start becoming kind to people around you. You don't become resentful. And can I slip in two other things? Of course. The other thing would be that if you can, I would like you to eat a plant-based meal at least once every day this week. And if you're already eating one plant-based meal, I would like you to eat two. And if you're already eating two, hey, make it three. <laughs> and if you can watch a documentary, go onto my website. I've recommended a whole bunch of documentaries. One of them is Running for Good, the most inspiring Fiona Oaks, who you will absolutely love. Uh, she's like an angel from heaven. Uh, and so that's Running for Good. And of course, The Game Changers and Folks Over Knives. Maybe if you can watch it with a friend or a partner, that would be three calls for action. I love it. Okay, well, they sound all fabulous. So be kind to yourself every day. Do something for yourself that's special to you. Could be a couple minutes, could be a whole day. You choose. Eat at least one plant-based meal per day. If you're already eating one, go for two. If already two, go for three and watch a documentary. All these are very pleasant. Nothing's gonna be painful. It's gonna be no. really great. A great, great week. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much for being on Veggie Doctor Radio. This has been so amazing. You are just such a lovely force. I love your energy. I love what you're doing in the world. So glad that I found you and we were able to connect. I hope that you have a plantastic day and I hope to see you this summer. You will see me this summer. And thank you so much, Yami, for inviting me. And I hope I haven't let the side down in London. <laughs> I hope that you enjoyed today's episode. Thank you for tuning in and I look forward to having you back again next week. A very special thank you to the band Rocket Surgeons for permission to use the broccoli song. To find out more about the Rocket Surgeons, please visit their website at rocketsurgeonsband.com or Facebook at Rocket Surgeons Music. Please subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Also, all of my social media links can be found in the podcast description. Send me a message and let me know what you think of today's podcast. Sharing is caring. Please share, rate, and review my podcast and drop me a line if you have ideas for future episodes. Thank you once again and have a plantastic day. We're having broccoli.